Hi there, everybody, and welcome to the Speak Dicely podcast, the show where I get together with other tabletop enthusiasts and we speak dicely together. And welcome to, yet again, the DM's Roundtable. And I am joined by the same voices that you would have heard in the last three sessions of this. But we've got one more topic that we're going to cover here today. And could I get you guys to introduce yourselves and where people can find you on the Internet? Uh, wow, it's been two weeks already. Feels <laughs> like it was just an hour ago. Uh, I'm, I'm Folkard. You can find me on a YouTube channel called Lutz and Dice and also on social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, and Patreon. Not quite a social media, but you get me. That's it. <laughs> and Fred? Yeah, Fred Wheeler, uh, How to d d YouTube channel, Facebook. Yes, I'm on Twitter. And no, I'm not a twit. And I talk about Dungeons and Dragons. That's me. And I'm Mark from Dungeon Class. I'm one half of Dungeon Class. Gonzo is the other half. And we talk about all things D&D, mostly all about the fun. We don't really get into all the crunchy mechanic stuff and all. So I just don't want to hear anything about the mechanics, anything mechanic oriented, really we're just not really into mechanics per se. Uh, so anyway, you can find us <laughs> at, uh, at Twitter, uh, on Twitter at uh, dungeon underscore class and Instagram. We're on there as Dungeon Class Show and Facebook and we have a Patreon as well and all that good stuff. But yeah, that's us. All right, what are we talking about today? Well, as it just so happens, I have a question about mechanics. <gasps> <laughs> I got this, I was joking. Uh Okay, cool. I'm glad you're on board. <laughs> <laughs> so let's face it. The D&D rules as written aren't perfect. And this might just be an opinion, but that's my opinion. Um, in fact, some rules don't even have a mechanic. And sometimes it's left up to the DM to interpret. So what I want to know is what is a rule in any tabletop role playing game system that was left vague and possibly unanswered? that you came up with a solid mechanic for. And Fulkert, if you want to lead us off with this one. All right. Well, um, first of all, I think, yeah, you said that D&D 5e rules are not perfect, but I think that's, uh, uh, that's definitely the reason why it got so popular. Uh, it, it sort of led us into a golden era of RPGs. Uh, it shows uh, with 3 million views and stuff. Uh, it's because I think they've, uh, they've found a golden line, like a middle, a super neat balance between uh, some detail stuff and uh, open-ended rules that anybody can modify to their own and uh i hear people complain about this all the time but at the same time it's i mean it works and i complain about it too like why is there no rules for uh, the, the crafting rules are bullshit but yeah you can you can totally uh build up on that uh and uh so what what have i done in my games um uh, honestly not much um, but, uh, I think that, um, I kind of made the, uh, learning new skills thing, uh, kind of more flexible in my games. Uh, so as written, you can acquire a language or I, th I think a proficiency or some, or something, uh, in almost a year, like you have to spend 300 days learning that, uh, eight hours per day I, I think it's in the in the dungeon master's guide but i made it so that you can only you can not only learn a proficiency but skills specific skills because my players were asking me this all the time like can i do this uh like disarm and there's a rule for disarming but i came up with kind of a better option of disarming like a more um, thing that her character could actually master and perform really well. And we came up with some rules and I said, okay, you practice 
for I mean, yeah, you've you've gonna spend that 300 days, but uh, or something like that. Maybe I came up with a smaller number because I mean that's bizarre. Uh, if you don't have downtime uh, between your adventures, it's gonna take forever. Uh, so instead of making it like okay, you you're learning like you know the progress bar, and then ting, you have the skill. Uh, I I made her, I, I always allow my players to use this skill from the from the beginning. Just uh, it's really hard. Like they're they're trying, but the DC is very high. Same goes for language learning. If a guy learns language for a month, he knows a couple of words, and he can describe stuff in really basic terms. So he can actually, uh, you know. Uh, deliver his thought will sound in like a moron but still uh besides the skills uh one thing came to my mind is i allowed my one of my players to run a guild and uh this is again uh, not covered by the rules i mean there are like running a business thing but it's su super vague and i i remember I kind of laughed at the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything entry where running a, a thing and it's just a tiny little paragraph saying, you can totally do that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> like, we believe in you. And that's it. No rules at all. Like, I mean, approval. If you yeah. want, you should. That's it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Jeez. And uh, so I actually... Uh, but, Around that time, we were playing uh, Rising, uh, the Rise of Tiamat, and uh, somewhere around the time, I bought a board game called Lords of Waterdeep. Perhaps ah. you know that. Uh, yeah, and it has... Uh, so basically, basically, you're one of the lords of uh, the city, and you kind of uh, you have quests that you that you can complete, and these quests have always inspired me for encounters in D&D and stuff because it has an art and a little flavor text and it actually makes sense you can you can send uh little uh little uh cubes that are represent clerics and fighters and rogues to the, to this quest and this quest needs two rogues and one cleric to complete uh, and it, and it, it all makes sense so i kind of got inspired by that and uh so she got her guild and what i did was uh people started showing up uh for for hiring for for hire and she hired them and i made uh this these little cards with really simplified stats so this is a person uh she's an assassin like your her archetype and she's she's proficient in two skills uh say stealth and performance and then there's other guy he's a thief and he's proficient with sleight of hand and stealth uh, and then uh, she she has a bunch of those. She, we actually role played the audition interview stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was all kind of uh, just intertwined into normal role playing. Uh, uh, but basically, a time comes when her she had actually what's the name of this fiend uh, that ends with. Zoloth, like Mendeloth, Menzeloth, you know the, oh, those kind of like, stuff. Oh, the like the, Arcanaloth and Yugoloth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Arcanaloth. That was the guy. He was like a fox. I thought mm -hmm. he was he was like an anime character, <laughs> and I made him uh, her like a Castellan, but not what do you call it? Like a dude that over overse overseer kind of the stuff at her guild, taking care of business when she's not around. Uh, and he was very charismatic, and he and her would. Uh, inter interview the newcomers. Uh, so anyway, and he and he would actually when she when she gets back to to her guild hall, which was beneath the the water deep city, uh, posing as a Harper branch. But actually, she was like, <laughs> this is actually an assassin's guild. Uh, and uh, she came back, and this guy Arkanaloth, he would present her with like like uh, with several options. Like we have these offers like business to escort these guys or to make a jailbreak here or to uh, go and check out the mausoleum in the city of the dead. And each one had a reward like, okay, they can grab a magic item from the mausoleum, uh, but 
lower the reputation with the harpers because they will start suspecting some cheesy situation going on. Or you can do jailbreak uh, stuff and uh, have reputation go up for the Xenathar's Guild or, or, or something. Uh, and these, these missions uh, require certain skills. And so she can take her hirelings and say, okay, which skill matches? And when she uh, when she uses certain hirelings, the DC lowers every time like the skill matches. And I found the system working so neatly. Like, it was so satisfying. It was like a mini game, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this. And then uh, uh, at the start of the next session, I would sort of she would she would have her report and what actually happened in a really uh, kind of role playing or artistic fashion. Uh, and it was it was really really engaging and really fast. So other players didn't have to wait uh, for hours for her to role play everything. So I really think that this, I might, I should do a PDF, I think. (laughs) Yeah, so that's all I've got. That, I'm very intrigued by that. And I really do like that Lords of Waterdeep board game. And yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I thought about that, like, the the cards they have with the quests on them. I always wondered if somebody was get, getting inspired by those to make quests. I'm glad to finally yeah. meet somebody who has been. I even get inspired by Magic the Gathering cards. Absolutely. Inspiration wherever you can find it. Uh, yeah. What about you, Fred? So uh, my channel deals with roles. A lot of them. That's what I built my channel on. And um, you would think that given that I talk about Dungeons and Dragons rules so much that I would have built game mechanics coming out my backside, but I leave that to Alan over on the dungeon. <laughs> game. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, he could poop them out faster than I could ever do it. Um, but I'm not actually really about the rules. The only reason I talk about rules is because People couldn't find that information on YouTube or the internet in a form where it was demonstrated. Because often when you you get somebody who's English, speaks modified English or Oxford English or Kiwi English, it's not really that clear. They have to actually see it physically done with dice, miniatures, a location or a map or something like that to help visualize and understand what's going on. So I made those videos for that purpose, but I don't really go into rules. So I would have to say that I have developed absolutely nothing as far as I'm concerned. What I do is I fill in gaps for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. There are gaps there and they are intentional. Some are unintentional, but quite often they are completely intentional. Okay, so I will fill them in. How do I fill them in? I use older versions of Dungeons and Dragons because whether people realize right. it or not, Dungeons and Dragons 5e is actually far more similar in many respects in terms of the core rules to the original Dungeons and Dragons basic, the very first system. If you look at that at its core, not the character stuff, because the character stuff is Bang is crazy, complicated. Don't give me a hard time. Those people who think that 5e character creation and character abilities and so forth are simple. Bollocks. Okay. But at the core, it's actually fairly simple and much more in line with that. So I use older versions. I use Star Wars Saga because I played a lot of Star Wars Saga. And it's actually based off, it's actually the first engine that created Dungeons and Dragons 4 but it had a few answers and things to fill in gaps. And I also use Fate. Fate is a system that has very few rules. It just has a lot of options and you use Fate points and it's very sort of um, nebulous. It's very story focused. So therefore you can fill in the gaps with a system that is already nebulous in nature if you think Dungeons and Dragons 5e is nebulous, or 
doesn't fill in all the gaps. So that's what I tend to do is I, that's how I fill in the gaps. And then I'm much more likely rather than creating game mechanics to strip rules out, tear them out and see what happens to your game system, particularly Dungeons and Dragons 5e, because I ultimately don't like Dungeons and Dragons 5e that much. I actually didn't feel like they went far enough. Yeah, I know a lot of you are like, what are you talking about? Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's a good system. It's popular because it, it made some of the correct decisions. But I felt like it. It's we never got the, the, the game we were told. Mike Mill said, we're going to get a game and it's basically going to have three engines. Really, really super basic. The core rule system that everybody's probably going to, the standard game that most people are, are going to play, which is what we get now. And then the advanced game where it'll have so many variant rules that every table will be completely different. Well, we have that, we have that, but we don't have this one. This one, this one gone. Oh, oh I lost that one. It's gone. So um, I try to think about how to fill in the gaps and strip things away when it's possible. And one of the things that has come up multiple times that I've made multiple videos on is stealth. Hiding, hidden, Oh my gosh, invisibility, that cause causes problems big time. So I made a whole bunch of videos explaining how to fill in the gaps, did a lot of research. Some of it is official and some of it is taking information that we used in previous versions of the game or other games to help it make sense to people. And I don't want to go over all of those refinements because no, thank you. Go watch the videos. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, so I see it more about what I'm doing is I'm refining rather than necessarily, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's filling the gaps. I would say it's refining. I think that is what is probably more important because I'm not really about game mechanics ultimately. Well, that's great. I mean, and You've brought up a lot of different systems there, and and I think it's it's definitely something that people should be doing. Like, even if you, for example, have found D and D five E, and you're like, "Oh, this is great," go play some other games, or at the very least, read some of the rules for other games because it inspires. It'll innovate whatever rule set you call your your home, I guess, uh, and and it'll only make ideas better. Um, and you know what you, I've heard so much about this fate system and yet I I'm a story-based GM. I, I feel, and, uh, I have not really scanned fate. I need to do that. <laughs> um, so I think that's going to be on my checklist coming up here now. Uh, Mark, what about you? Any, any mechanics that you have played with? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, there are some really good points here. I, I, the idea I, I do like Fred, I look to the old to fill in gaps as well. Um, but honestly, uh, and I like what you said about, I like what it was said about stripping out the game to what's, you know, everything has been distilled down to advantage and disadvantages, you know, that a lot of the rules all just, you know, why to have this and we can just make everything disadvantage and advantage. So often if it's not in there, then I'll say, okay, roll uh, D20 and roll with advantage, disadvantage. And I have a number in mind, a DC level. I'm having, if they hit that, they got it, whatever. So I find myself doing that a lot. But one thing I did that kind of tweaked, I, I couldn't find anything. This is not, not like something that was vague. It's something that was left out altogether. I have not seen any rules for a cave-in, uh, a collapsed building, you know, the kind of, oh my gosh, the building's collapsing. What are we going to do? Uh, so, and this is not, rocket surgery um but the idea of like rolling a series of dexterity saves that's been done many times what i do is i do um as the as it progresses i might do three rolls up to seven rolls to get out depending on the size of the building or the cave they're trying to get out of and a series of dex saves but each time the the die gets bigger so this first time it's a six-sided dies next time it's 10 next time it's 12 and then 20 because like in a building, it's just the chunks of stuff are just getting worse. It's getting more intense. It ups the intensity and the cinematics of the, oh my gosh. And and I know this works pretty well because I've killed two characters with this uh, system. <laughs> and so I know that's totally great. You know, and, and it's been it's been a thing. But 
at the end of the day, uh, I'm okay with killing a character if they say, well, that makes sense. You know, you know, like I died, but you know what? It was a, it was a tragic situation. It made sense that we're trying to get up three levels of the building and, uh, and we just almost made it. But yet for that one trip up on the way out, we, the thing came down on us and we all, I, I just sustained way too much damage. And, and so um, that's, that's kind of my thing, but uh, yeah, I agree that honestly, it's, it's kind of interesting to me. I watch these videos and they, all these game mechanics. I'm like, okay, you're just uh, putting back all the things that they took out to make 5e. You're, you're kind of going backwards and making it crunchier is what we call it. And that you're going to have a mechanic for every single thing. When honestly, often as DMs, it's like, yeah, I, I didn't think that was coming up. Um, I'm going to make this on the fly. It makes sense that you would roll this kind of die and just see how it goes and roll with advantage, disadvantage. And, and that's that. So I kind of chuckle a little bit when I see that people like they have, Oh, I got a new mechanic for this and a new mechanic for that. And I'm like, you're not even playing five E anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's great that you have this game that you're playing now, but it's, it's not even that game anymore. So it's, uh, it's cool. I understand it. And I've seen some pretty cool mechanics. I know um, stuff I've seen. Um, um, Critical Role, uh, Matt Mercer do some of his mechanic ideas. I'm like, that's pretty genius. That's a slick idea, you know, but, uh, but at the end of the day, um, I think keep it simple. And, um, and honestly, if you look to the past, you're going to find someone, they, they used to have that and they took it out at some point just so they didn't want to have a, a million different books. They just have these, these, these you know, small books that they're, that they're using. So um, no, I agree hundred um, percent, but um, yeah, keep it simple. Yeah, that, I think you know, the more experience you get, the less you care about rules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I was running the Genesis uh, RPG, uh, I had no idea. Like, I just I didn't even look on the skills. Like, you know, it has the number of skills, like uh, acrobatics and stuff like that. Uh, the, the character, the player wants to do something, and I'm like, uh, can you show me a character sheet? Like what's in there? Like yeah, roll that one. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I I didn't care about the rules at all. Uh, I had to look for stuff because uh, that system had a lot of features for each weapon. Like this weapon has a blast four, and I'm like, what is that? So I had to look it up. But the core rules are whatever. Just uh, use it to. It's, it has to be a tool for the story and not something to, that bugs you down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I find this very fascinating because um, I'll be frank, I, I started in fourth edition, so I started very late in comparison. So I don't really know much about the older editions other than some skimmings I've done since having started 10 years ago. Um, but a lot of my like, going back to past editions is quite limited. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny to see that everybody's like, Oh, D and D five E is such a great edition. And here, what we're doing is nobody's playing the same game because we're all either adding or stripping and just making it our own. And that's, I feel the pure intention of the edition. Um, now that being said, I created a mechanic that, even in my games did not need to be created, but I created it just for the pure sake of being like, all right, my players, this is how we're going to change this one thing. So I've written a mechanic and this, this came about because of a, a realization of something awkward. So in D and D, when you drop to zero hit points, you start rolling death saves and the groups, the group I play with is very, very into the role play and that that kind of side of like almost all of them are like feel very actory and so in those situations where you're rolling death saves mechanically you're unconscious and what that includes is you can't talk you don't know what's going on you're dying but in a role a heavy role play game somebody who's probably about to die wants to have that like on death's door like monologue but if they get that, why can't they heal them? <laughs> so my workaround for that was I created a new condition for when you drop to zero hit points called bleeding out. And basically, it's just you do your death saves, 
but you're still technically conscious and you can only talk to and see things within a five foot area around you. So it's like you're very limited in your awareness, but you can have those moments before you die. And then once you fail that the third death save, you are dead. No more words. Your character is done. So that somebody can come up to you and say, you're, you're going to get it, but you're going to make it. Yeah. 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 We're just, just dying out of here. Don't you dare die on me. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That very cinematic, like a person's yeah, yeah, about yeah. to die moment. Yeah. 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 Good. I like it. Yeah. No. And I actually, I was just sitting here thinking when you were, you were talking about death, I, I kind of feel like that is vague how you do death. Uh, you know, there are some rules, obviously death saves and all that, but, um, but then there's like, you know, how far, what do you want to do with resurrection and stuff? Do you allow resurrection? How easy is it to resurrect in the game? Um, I like that um, what Matt Mercer does with the, you come, if you come back, okay, but it's harder to come back the next time, you know? So I like that little mechanic because, you know, it can be like, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back, I'm back again. You know, there has, I like the idea of there being, um, it, it's getting worse. This is getting harder to do that. You can't always come back because honestly in 5e, it's so easy to come back. Right. And no one actually dies or, you know, it's kind of the way. So it, I like that gritty, I think, but I kind of almost feel like if anything's vague, it's that death mechanic. It, while it does have rules and all that, it, it it's, it's ripe for tweaking uh, is what mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying. So I, I like what you're saying that that makes sense uh, given the situation. Yeah. It's, it's funny to consider that even in D and D death is a mystery. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, oh, are there any final notes anybody has about this topic of conversation before we uh, wrap, close up? Nope. All right. It seems we've had our full bout of uh, mechanics here today. So thank you all for sharing rules and ideas you've had of, of your own games and what you've observed out there. And to everybody who's tuned in, be sure to follow these friendly folks on YouTube and they have all their channels. If you like D&D &D and tabletop content, be sure to follow them. And until next time, this I think this is the last of this particular crew. So some new faces, some new voices next time. So thank you guys for joining me for these these videos. This was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was fun. It's been great. All right. Until next time, folks, you all have a great night or day and we'll see you later. Bye. This episode of the Speak Dicely podcast was produced and edited by myself, Denny Brandt, and the intro and outro music were created by Salik Brandt. Thank you for the support, and we'll see you next time on the Speak Dicely podcast.